Привет, дорогие друзья! Меня зовут Юля, и продюсер Эстетики Стрелка. Спасибо всем, кто смотрит нас в YouTube и в ВКонтакте, и проведет с нами в ближайший час. Хочу представить сегодняшнего спикера программы «Стрелка 2020 Лайв» Питера Ванаса, архитектора, основателя голландского бюро SLA, профессора курса «Architecture and Social Thinking» Амстердамской академии архитектуры. А Питер расскажет о том, как принципы циркулярной экономики могут применяться архитекторами. После лекции пройдет серия Q&A. Пожалуйста, задавайте свои вопросы во всех соцсетях, на любых языках, под постом трансляции. И во время эфира мы их соберем и передадим Питеру. Лекция пройдет на английском языке с переводом на русский. Вы можете смотреть русская дорожка в русскоязычном в Facebook и ВКонтакте Института Стрелка и на английском в YouTube. На этом передаю слово Питеру Ванасте. Evening. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for being uh, your guest tonight. I am very pleased to be here. Tonight I will talk about architecture and circular thinking. Um, I am a, a, an architect. My studio is called Bureau Sla. It's based in Amsterdam and I am also a professor of architecture and circular thinking at the Academy of Architecture in Amsterdam, as Julia just told you. Um, so tonight I will talk about uh, architecture, but I will also talk about uh, a new uh, ways of thinking and a new paradigm shift in thinking in the society that we live in. Um, to start um, new ways of thinking, we first have to uh, give you Uh, ideas of thinking in the previous ages and we will start with models of doom this is uh, this might sound as a bad news as a sort of a sad start of a actually really exciting story and an exciting lecture as you will soon ex experience um, but it is important to start with models of doom and i would like to start with a uh, with a quote of a famous Dutch writer who is called Sees Notenboom and Sees Notenboom once said history has no purpose only consequences history has no purpose only consequences and i really love this saying um, because it's a beautiful way of saying that actions we take now have consequences in the future i also like it because there is no morality attached to it there is no morals involved it's not about right or wrong it's not about doing uh, the right things it's, it's it's not about religion it's not about ideology it just means what it says actions have consequences and actions have consequences was exactly the aim of the study that 13 scientists of mit in the united states um uh, investigated Here are the, the five people, the five main persons of this, uh, of this research group, of these MIT scientists, Jürgen Randers, Jay Forrester, Donella, and Dennis Meadows, and William Behrens. And the two in the middle, the woman, Donella Meadows, and the woman, and the man, uh, write to her, her husband, Dennis Meadows. Um, they uh, they said, set out this research and this investigation uh, i will tell you about it they got money from the volkswagen foundation the volkswagen foundation in germany and th this might seem a detail but as you will see in the the in the following of the lecture this is an important detail so what did these 13 scientists of mit ask themselves they wanted to make a simulation They said, we want to investigate actions and consequences. We want to investigate actions of mankind and the consequences for the world. So they wrote a computer program, and you see the computer here in 1970. Um, this computer program was going to be a simulation of the world. Now, can you imagine um, what a big task this would be to simulate the world? They named the computer program World three which is the most uninspiring name that you can imagine but still it was a simulation of the world and you see the computer program here this is world 
three. We will not go into it. It looks, um, well, it, you could say it looks uh, for a computer program that simulates the world. It looks actually very simple. So the uninspiring name World 3 has this simple computer simulation software from the 1970s. So far so good, you might imagine. What did they do? They collected data. Uh, these 13 scientists collected data from the United Nations, from statistical institutions, from environmental institutions, etc., etc. They included uh, food production, birth rate, the death rate, pollution, resources, and so on and so forth. And this is what they saw. You can see in the graph the pollution, the, um, the amount of resources, the pollution, and the number of people on the earth. And this is only four uh, diagrams of uh, many, many, I think about 25 that they had so far. So good, you can see it starts in 1900 because this is, this is when the world started collecting data and uh, the moment they wrote this computer program, we are talking 1970. So based on this computer uh, program, uh, they made 11 scenarios. And remember, we are talking actions and consequences. So what mankind does has influences for uh, the world in, in the future. World 3, this computer program, made 11 scenarios based, of course, on the behavior of mankind. And what you see here is one of the 11 scenarios. You can see that pollution is going to rise just a little bit. Economy will go up, but then stabilize. Uh, pollution will go up a little bit, uh, and uh, uh, at some point, economy will go down. They had one scenario, the most um, simple scenario, they called the standard run scenario. Again, a very uninspiring name. The standard run scenario was going to be the business as usual scenario. And this scenario was a very simple scenario. It said, if mankind models along, it doesn't uh, change anything that it does now, we will see the scenario that you do here. So the actions of mankind will stay the same. Um, the computer world three, this model, calculates what will happen. And as you can see, um, all these things rise and rise and rise, and then suddenly collapse. They called it overshoot and collapse. And this collapse moment would be in 2070. 2070, so 100 years after 1970. Now you have to understand that these scientists were very famous scientists and they got a lot of money from the Volkswagen Foundation, but other scientists hated them. They hated the computer model, they hated the work that they did. And this became actually very emotional. So one of the people um, writing about this computer model, Peter Passel, in 1971 in the New York Times, he said, and I'm going to read it from the, my piece of paper here. He said, this computer program is an empty and misleading work. It's best summarized as the rediscovery of the oldest computer paradigm of computer science. Garbage in, garbage out. He found the World 3 program very simplistic and politically motivated. All scenarios would inevitably lead to the destruction of the Earth. Um, another scientist from uh, the United Kingdom, of course, the United Kingdom and the United States, they were probably also politically motivated. She said, Jerry Jehoda from the University of Sussex, she said, they are all models of doom. 1970, we talk. But now you have to imagine, 1970, they made this computer model, World 3. Um, after 50 years almost, so we are talking now 2014, one scientist uh, named Turner, Professor Turner from the University of Melbourne, thought we can test this program. We can see after 50 years what happened to the models, the 11 models that um, the Meadows. Uh, 
family and the 13 scientists actually made. So they collected the data exactly as the Meadows scientists did. So they collected data from the United Nations, from UNESCO, from the US Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, from BP, British Petrol, Statistical Review. They collected data from weather institutions about pollution, food, birth rate, economy, and so on and so forth. And they made this graph that you see now, and they just put in the, the data, maybe you can put on the graph, there we go. You see the data 50 years, 2014, almost 50 years, well, 44 years after 1970. And as you can see, what happens that we are still in the standard run business as usual mode. So the Meadows family, the 13 scientists would say, actions have consequences after 50 years. If we don't do anything in 2070, our world will go in overshoot and collapse mode. We are 50 ways underway now. And so far, we haven't done anything. So the report that the Meadows uh, scientists wrote is called the limits to growth. You might know it. It was the, the Club of Rome uh, that published this report eventually in 1970. Uh, the Graham Turner report from the University of Melbourne on the right side is in 2014. We are now already 2020. So far, these scientists said actions have consequences. So far, we as mankind have done nothing. You could ask yourself, is this bad news or not? Is this good or, or is this bad? We will not go into morals. We will not go into a dispute about what is good and what is wrong, what is right and what is wrong. But we can see again data. And I will promise you, the, the nice images will come later in this lecture. But we have to start with a few um, dry data. What you see here is the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and the Antarctic temperature in our atmosphere. And as you see on your screen, it might be small, but, but it's 800,000 years ago. So um, the Homo sapiens starts somewhere um, on two thirds of this graph and the year zero is almost at the, at the end. As you can see, the temperature is not so bad. The amount of carbon dioxide is not so bad. We have seen times before in our history where this amount of carbon dioxide and temperature was the same. So the good news is the Earth can handle it. We will not destroy the Earth. We will only destroy mankind. But nature does not care. It's okay. Man does have a significant influence on planet Earth, but the Earth itself will not care. It's okay. But this is why we call uh, the, the era that we live in now, we call it the Anthropocene. What does Anthropocene mean? It is the name of our geological era. Uh, it means that the human influence on the physiognomy, on the face of our Earth, the human influence is decisive, is decisive, it means. So the good news is we humans, we decide. We are in charge of what our planet will look like. This was not the case before. Our previous geological area era was the Holocene. Now we live in the Anthropocene. And the Anthropocene is beautiful. As you can see in these images, the, um, mankind is capable of providing beautiful, at least, images. And these images you see here are made by the Canadian photographer, Edward Burkinski. And Edward Burkinski, I had contact with him, is not only a fantastic photographer, but also a very nice person. And he gave me his kind permission to use his work. And these images that you see here are all images made by Edward Burkinski. And he even made a movie. And the movie, of course, is called Anthropocene. What you see here, this image is an image of the mines in Italy, the Carrera Marmor Mines. And he made, he, uh, Edward Burkinski went to, went to many places on the earth and he took photos 
in all these places. But he also made a movie, and the movie is called Anthropocene. And I'm going to show you a very short um, uh, part of this movie. What you see here, what you just saw, are images from from a mine, of course. Um, and one of the one of the uh, people that watched this movie and wrote an article about it says it's it's so beautiful, but it's also very paradoxical. It's a very paradoxical desire to to witness the destruction of the earth. Um, and what you can see is that that overshoot or collapse or not, standard run or not, world three model or not, it, uh, the movie shows that we have a certain relation to material and a, a certain relationship to how we use the things on our planet and how we use the materials of the earth. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, in the next chapter different relationships that we have uh, over the years in the use of material. And to illustrate this, we go back to 1960. In 1960, um, we see, we will see a little fragment of, of a series that is a United States series. It's called Mad Man. And Mad Man is about this New York advertising agent and the New York advertising person uh, starts having nothing. And then he entered this company, this advertising company, and he starts being famous and rich and every year every month he gets more money and he becomes more wealthy this man don graper is a, is a protagonist of the american dream um, and at, this, at some point he's able to buy this car this buc le sabre the buc le sabre it's its beauty is just the beginning that was the advertisement it it said it will do everything for you except good breakfast this car was, was the icon of American hero ship and the American way of life. And then in the car this again? What happens. And now he's and running around. From the 1960s, of course, made. So I don't understand. You'd rather play checkers than my look at the clouds game. I'd rather play with Philly Potty. I don't want to jam between my seats. You know what, Sally? Go play with Bobby. We should do this more often. We should only do this. I have to go pee pee. I'm behind the tree there, no one's looking. I wanna tinkle outside. Mm, I don't know. It's 
different for boys. I think everybody should go before we get in the car. Do you have to go? No. The kids are lucky. When I was a little boy, back on the farm, we had an outhouse way out in the yard. And on nights when there was no moon, there was this rope, and you had to feel for it in the dark and pull yourself across. I'm glad we didn't live in the olden days. <laughs> Are we rich? It's not polite to talk about money. I did it! I did it! We should probably get going if we don't want to hit traffic. Sally, pack up the checkers. Check their hands. Okay. The first time I saw this this movie fragment, I was I was almost shocked. I thought, "You must be kidding me! You are not throwing away all this garbage." So first, you you take excellent care that the kids have clean hands, that the kids don't waste the car, that they cannot eat something in the car because the car might get dirty. Oh no! But it's perfectly fine to throw away all the litter, all the garbage out of your picnic. Uh, into the the park and actually it used to be be completely normal from somebody from the 1960s to 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 a drive in a car have a bottle of coca-cola open the window when the bottle is empty and throw it out of the window it, onto the side of the road nobody would look funny at you nobody would think that you would do something wrong but how much we now think that this is hypocritical we must understand that we are also the hypocrites of our age. We are the Don Graper and Betty. Betty is his wife of our time. And you can see that in plastic bottles. So a plastic bottle is useful for a few hours. We only use it for a drink for a few hours. But it has a lifetime of 100 years. And if you think about it, this is absurd. Why would you make something that you need for two hours but will last for 100 years? This makes no sense. It makes a lot of waste. There is an enormous discrepancy between use time and lifetime of our products. And this seems to be of little concern. But why would you do this? So this is a very linear, very one-dimensional way of looking at uh, things that we use. And we made these images of plastic materials also to show that actually what we throw away, th that the waste that we use can also be um, beautiful. But one day we got, as an agency, a, a commission. Somebody asked us, can you do something with all this plastic waste that we have around us? And we thought, well, why not? Let's do something. So. Here you see us, we are the heroes of this story. And we, that is Bureau Sla, my company and overtraders, they, my friends. And we wanted to do something about the, the misunderstanding between use time of products and lifetime of products. And you have to understand that the plastic industry is a very stupid traditional industry. They only think that plastic has to be, you have to make it fast, it has to be really cheap, Everything has to be identical and you cannot see the production of how it's made. So we wanted to make something else and we started our own plastic 
factory and you see the factory here the, the factory we had to make the factory because we talked to all the industry people the big companies and they all said what you want to do is insane it makes no sense what did we want to do we wanted to make a unique plastic product but in large amounts so we did not want to make another vase vase or a lampshade or a key holder uh, or or piece of jewel we want to make something that is actually important that actually makes sense we want to make a real facade material a cladding material that you can use on your buildings and i'll show you a little movie about also one minute or two minutes about how we did this and what the sort of atmosphere was in uh, how we did this <laughs> What you see here was the first product that we actually made with our pretty plastic that's how it's called pretty plastic factory and and i must say when we made this image when we made this mock-up we were so happy we were incredibly happy because it looked amazing and we could not even understand ourselves that this is what waste can look like this what you see here what you see on your screen now is directly from the garbage nothing we didn't change anything it's yogurt bottles it's shampoo bottles it's a uh, plastic cladding and it comes directly out of the waste bin and um, people couldn't believe we had done this and people couldn't believe we hadn't uh, done anything with this material and then we discovered also this company that makes plastic uh, blanks of plastic material that you see here that's the construction of this little of this little pavilion that you see here and normally they use this plastic for uh, horse stables or pig factories so it's the lowest quality cheap material that you only use for animals for stables and we use their product and we combined it with our pretty plastic garbage factory materials and then we could make this and what you see here um, um, is all plastic except for the wires except for the lamp except for the screws and except from the girl it is all from the garbage bin it's waste um, and we thought okay if this is possible this is the start of a new economy this is the start of a new way of thinking um, <clears throat> and then 
we enter this phase of something called circular economy, circular thinking, as opposed to linear economy and linear thinking. But of course, our nature has always been circular. Circular in the sense that things in nature are all right. The bird, the bird you see here, can eat as much as it wants. There is nobody that, that will say, you cannot eat too much because it's bad for the economy, it's bad for nature. The bird can shit as much as it wants. The bird can have babies as much as the bird wants. Nature is fine. Uh, the economy will not be harmed. And actually, our building, um, our building construction used to be pretty sustainable also. It used to be a very circular construction way of building. As you can see here, the wood you can reuse, buildings would last for a long time. It's, it, it would be perfectly fine, no damage done. And if you look at a, at a farmer, a farmer from the 19th century, that would also be a very circular economy, no harm to our ecology, no harm to our waste or uh, environment done. The farmer, everything that the farmer would use, everything that the farmer would produce, everything, every waste that the farmer would have would all be uh, solved or stored in, in the own farm. So if you have waste, there would not be so much waste, but if there would be waste, you could you would always be able to recycle it. And somehow in cities, of course, this is more difficult. But in the 19th century, also in cities, it would be pretty sustainable. But in our days, it is very difficult. And imagine that um, we would act or we would behave as the farmer in the 19th century. Imagine that you would, you would have to take care of your own waste. It would mean that out of the 40 an 80 gram of plastic waste that you and I produce per person per day. This is these are the num the numbers from Germany. If you would if you would be forced to keep it for yourself and not throw it away to somewhere where you don't know what it ends in a lifetime, you would have for 15 cubic meters of solid plastic waste, and you would be forced to store it in your own farm, this means in your own house. So you would have to, to make a reservation of one room in your house to store all the plastic garbage that you will uh, that you will produce in one lifetime. And this of course is a funny anecdote, but what is what is important is that you have to understand that that we produce a lot of waste. This is not per se bad, but it's also not very smart. This graph shows the production of a waste in Germany in 2016 and the light blue the light blue is the the waste that is produced by building and infrastructure um, uh, by building and infrastructure production so you have to imagine that building and infrastructure produces more than half of the waste of a country it means it's 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 designed by people like me by architects and and engineers. The waste comes from roads and buildings. And now, of course, we are developing tools. And this is one diagram of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in 2012, so already eight years ago, to stop producing more and more garbage because it just makes no sense. And what all these tools say is that in the old way, we mine resources, we build something, and when we don't need it, we throw it away. It's dumped. We have to replace this by some kind of a more intelligent, circular way of thinking. And it means that in the natural state of being for all life and matter, as you can see by the dynamic diagram, the circle, um, in the traditional economy, you only use a specific part of the, of the natural state of life and matter. It is mostly the part where you make money. So plastic is goes from oil to garbage. You make money in the little in the little piece in the middle. But as we have seen, it will last for 100 years. So it's not very smart in the life cycle. So we should not we should start thinking about cycles in life and the material 
will go in circles. But this is also, of course, a simplification of our lives. We don't turn in circles. We are much more reuse and use. So in the end, it will uh, there'll be a dynamic use and reuse of materials of functions in constant transformation. Some transformations go slow. Some transformations go fast. But it will be it will be a beautiful dance of material, people, function and space. And what you see here is that the original sort of very traditional, not very intelligent uh, linear economy, you make money only in the little part of a material's life cycle, will be replaced by a more circular economy where actually you can make money everywhere. So it's also a very economic, healthy system. And I will show you one project that we did showing this, and it's a bit of an older project, but this was our first discovery of how beautiful circular thinking is. And this was even before the age of the world of circular thinking. This little bar is made by my friends and me. Um, and we, we just did it ourselves because there was nowhere in our area where we could drink good coffee. Of course, as a designer, you need good coffee. There was no bar in our area. So we decided we will make our own coffee bar. But we wanted, of course, to make it cheap because we did, didn't have so much money. And we wanted also to test something. We said, OK, we will make this bar, but we will only use secondhand materials, 100% secondhand, no exceptions. And of course, we wanted it to look good because in the end, we are architects. So there is this website, it's called Marketplace. It's like eBay. And I'm sure in Moscow, you have and Russia, you have the, the same system. There are websites where you can buy secondhand goods. And that's what we did. We, we went around the Netherlands in this case, and we collected materials from all these people. As a designer, this is very uncomfortable. Because normally you first make a design and then you order materials. You think of buying materials with a contractor. But now, first you have to collect materials and then you have to design. You cannot make a drawing that's very uncomfortable. So we went around, we asked people, what is it used for? Why did you put it on Marketplace? How nice is it? Um, and this is a little one minute movie about how we did this. So what we did is we asked all these people, where did you get this material from? What did you use it for? Why do you sell it? Do you know what we are doing? Uh, can I make a picture of you and write three lines of the history of this material? And the person that has his hands for his eyes is the person that sold materials of his boss. So he didn't want to be on the photo, but uh, he was so kind to do it. Anyway, and then we saw that, that yes, we have all these materials, but all the materials have a history and have identity. And this bar, this little bar looked beautiful. It was all secondhand materials, but all the materials, it was not a collection of just secondhand materials, but also a collection of stories. And it was like the materials finally had identity. And then when we looked in history, we found out that there were many people thinking like this, that actually we were not the only ones, that also Jean Prouvé or Buckminster Fuller all had modes of thinking in a circular, circular sustainable strategy. Um, and it was like all these, these designers, they, they said to us, look at materials like in physics. In physics, water can exist in three, actually in four, but can exist in three modes, in three states. It's called aggregation states. Water can be liquid, water can be solid, 
water can be steam, can be gas. And the nice thing is you can go from one state to the other state without losing any quality of the water. Water after water after five million times of becoming ice and uh, steam will still be the same good water. Actually, the water that you use has gone from these different states. And it should be the same with material. You saw a little example of this uh, people's pavilion in the movie. This, this is a 100% borrowed building. Um, so we thought maybe we can make a building where everything is borrowed and we don't have to um, we don't have to damage the materials the, the pavilion is just a temporary storage of these materials for nine days was this so we could not screw not glue not saw not drill we had to find new construction methods to make this building which could house 250 people um, we found these new construction methods. We found a new way of building and a new way of construction. And this is the image after the show, after this, uh, this event of nine days. So all the materials were back on track again. And this is a two minute movie of the building um, setting up and going down. And of course, the, the demolishing of the building is as important as the construction of the building. This, of course, makes puts us in a position that we architects, we are the designers of this future. And it reminded me of a story of one of my teachers that asked us in the first year of our school what makes an architect. And of course, we said buildings. We said we an architect makes social relevance. An architect makes makes pleasant environments. An architect makes functions. An architect makes makes living environments. And our teacher said, no, 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 no. He was an Italian teacher. He said, no, no, an architect makes a drawing, nothing else. And of course, I understood this. An architect does not make buildings. An architect makes just a drawing. But of course, lines on paper mean something. It's like a poet. When a poet writes words, he or she can unleash revolutions. And with architects, it's the same. Lines on paper can change the world. As we, can, as we have seen, it will change the world because half of the waste that our society produces is made by lines on paper to start with. So we have the responsibility here. And if you compare this to artists, it's like, like on the one hand side, you have this piece of art of Laszlo, Moli Nagy, a Hungarian uh, art artist that worked at Bauhaus when he made this image. He made this image by describing it to an advertising sign factory on the telephone. He was not interested in making, not even pay a drawing. And this is a very conceptual drawing. He only saw what he designed when the advertising company, when the sign making company delivered it to his home. This is when he saw the result of his design. And on the other hand, we have Michelangelo. Michelangelo says, um, 
I am not interested in concepts. I don't mind about concepts. It's not important concepts. The only thing that you have to do is take a piece of marble, the marble block, and you have to look what is already inside. You only have to set the angel that is inside the marble block free. That's all you have to do. You have to take away the material that is not needed. And of course, most architects work like Laszlo Moholy-Nagy. They make a drawing. They are not interested in material. They do not work like Michelangelo. Um, we thought as a company, maybe we should work like Michelangelo's at least one time. We should ask ourselves, um, let's, not, let's not make a drawing, but let's look at the material. Let's look at, say, let's look at a brick and let's ask to the brick, what do you want to be, brick? You have to tell me, what is it? What life do you want to leave? Um, we are, I'm not going to design, I'm, I'm going to set you free, I'm going to let you speak. And this is what the brick said to us. The brick said, I want to be this, I want to be this house, I want to look like this. And this is what it looked like. We built two houses by not making a conceptual design, but to let the material speak. And here you see the, the two houses. And this is important because it shows that architecture is a cultural phenomena and it deals with material. And the way that you deal with material is, um, is, has a cultural significance. And for some reason, and you have, to, you have to, I'm asking everybody, explain me why, for some reason, sustainable architecture is always connected to manuals like this, 1970 manuals. And if you are a really good sustainable architect, you make buildings like this. You make buildings that have no straight angles. You have buildings that are badly painted. You have buildings that have all the wrong window frames. You have buildings that look like it's not meant for a human being. It's meant for a hobbit to live in. You make um, buildings that use old car tires and you put grass on the roof all the time. And you ask yourself, why is this the icon of sustainable architecture? Why is sustainable architecture not something like this? Um, this is a design that we made and we made it for the most corporate company in, uh, in the world almost. I'm not going to say which company, um, a, a very corporate company. Um, they wanted this building for, for a show for nine days and they said we want to have the most sustainable building in the world but also it has to look very corporate so no buckwheat burger architecture no uh, no sandals we are uh, designers and we want to look smart so we needed to find a new vocabulary for the most sustainable architecture that you can imagine and this is not easy uh, because architecture means something the way that we use material mean something. What it means, for, for example, in this way, in the Beaux-Arts uh, architecture, in the Beaux-Arts materials mean that we use, uh, that we express a national identity. Material plays a certain role in this. If you look at the arts and crafts movement from the United Kingdom, it started in the United Kingdom, it also went to the Europe mainland, it also means something. Architecture is an expression of culture. In this way, it has to be honest, it has to be skillful, it has to show what a man, what a craftsman can do. But there's also a political side to it. Architecture in modernism uh, means it has to look smooth and it is an elevation of the working class. So the working class has to be educated. The use of material means working class, we will educate you and you will be um, you will be smart in this new culture. But of course, now we are in confusion. We don't know what is good uh, and what is not good anymore. We don't know what is what our um, use of material means. And in the 2014 Biennale in Venice, I hope one day that we will have a Biennale again. In the 2014 Biennale, Ren Koolhaas was also in confusion. And he said, okay, I don't know what architecture means. I don't know what, what elements mean. I will go 
or what material means, I will go back to the very basics. I will go back to elements, to doors, windows, stairs, walls, ceiling. What does it mean? So the world is in confusion and we need to find a new vocabulary to, to express our new relationship to material. And this re research is done on multiple levels. And I'm, I am, I'm very happy that, that we, with the start of our plastic factory, started this new thinking of materials. And what you see here is, again, waste. And it's an icon of... Um, the circular economy and now you can buy this waste and this is a very commercial very plain i'm going to do a little bit of advertisement here you have to excuse me for that but this is a new phase of um, at least a, a paradigm shift in thinking of what material can mean in a circular economy here this is plastic plastic in large quantities but also it's 100 recycled and every tile every facade tile looks different so with this little small element we can we can give sustainable architecture a new face a new vocabulary a new identity that actually looks good and is a different way of looking at material which was not possible 15 years ago so this is the end of the advertisement i will go to uh, architecture again in in uh, in what architects can do and what designers can do in playing this role of inventing this new uh, vocabulary and how to make this difference we have seen that we are responsible for 50 percent of the waste so we have to find a new material system logic and we ask ourselves what does this new architecture look like and of course i'm not going to give you answers because i just don't know but i do know that new uses of material will lead to major shifts in society and it has happened before as you can see here this example it's we are now 1885 in chicago in 1885 in chicago land was very expensive it was insanely expensive it was so expensive that you cannot you can you could not build an office building because you would not be able to make enough square meters to make your excel sheet uh, work right you would always lose money so you need to build higher you need to build more but it was not possible to build higher until this architect show us shows up william Le baron jenny and he makes this design and you all may know it because it's a very famous example he makes this office building for the home insurance company it's an insurance company very boring but he makes this very interesting building he uses two inventions that were already there and with these two inventions he changes the world these two inventions are the elevator and the use of steel as a construction method. It's very simple, but by using the elevator, you can go up more than 10 stories. And for the first time in history, elevators were safe in 1885 by the use of Otis and Siemens. And he uses steel construction, which was an unheard way of building. You must be insane in 1885 to use steel for building a construction, but he does safe two-thirds of the weight of his building so he can go higher and this is the first skyscraper in history and it seems just a detail because as you already can see the building on the left of this building is a little bit higher already only a few years later but it does allow us to do things like this it does allow us to make cities like this and you should you should realize that it's not about this image. It's about a new way of living. This way of living allows us to combine work to com and um, and and uh, live. So we can we can have our social life here. We can have our working life here. We can have, have our private life here. So the city suddenly becomes the dynamic, and it leads to huge societal changes. And the same will happen with new use of material. I am sure of this. This is a very simple example. In, the, in Europe, you have to have an energy label for your building. It's a very small change. But all the buildings 
until 1980 would not even have energy label D. They would be have energy label uh, E, F, or G, even worse. But now it's it's um, it's it's the law that you have to make buildings uh, energy label A. And of course, it makes sense. And we will have a circularity label because we need to find this new way of dealing with material. So we will. There will be at some point, I am sure, the circularity label. Actually, there already is, but it's it's a bit of a joke right now, but it will become serious. And things will change. It's not just you buy things from the shop, but you will have to deal with materials that might already be there or that will be a reuse from buildings somewhere else. It will also change the processes that we use now to make buildings. In this diagram, you see a very traditional way of hierarchy between the client and the builders. As an architect, I cannot talk to a builder. I am not allowed to talk to a carpenter because the contractor knows that when I, as an architect, start talking to the contractor, to the builder, to the carpenter, he knows we will have problems because it will last longer, it will be more expensive and it will be uh, it will be more complicated. And I know now that because we built this house, these houses ourselves, that this is a very old fashioned traditional way of thinking. It's, it does make no sense to be an architect and then be a good architect without ever in your life talking to somebody who makes the building. So this has to, to change. We have to go to a system that is actually more uh, a shared system of uh, combining a responsibility so that actually we can talk to each other and we can use the knowledge that producers have, that builders have. The tax system will be the same. The tax system now is a, very, is a, is a system that is based on right and wrong. So we do the tax things that we think are not valuable, but we do not tax things that are valuable. So education in the Netherlands, I think even in Europe, is not taxed. There are no taxes on this. But if we, if I go by train, I have to pay 9% taxes. Plastic bottles have 21% taxes because they do something with the environment. But actually 21% is the is the standard tax rate in the Netherlands. But cigarettes are taxed with 79% because we think smoking is not good. So we should stop people from smoking. So we tax cigarettes with 79%. So they become expensive and hopefully they stop smoking. But also we lose a lot of money as a state. Um, but kerosene, so the fuel for airplanes is taxed with 0%. Or if you produce pigs, it's per, it's um, 9% taxes in the Netherlands. Actually, in the Netherlands, there live more pigs than people. Labor is taxed with more than 36%. And this is also a very stupid system. Why would you do this? It will lead to standard run business as usual, overshoot and collapse. Labor actually is the most sustainable asset that you could, can imagine in the world because uh, because somebody working will not produce waste. If you work and you sleep a little, little bit, you eat a little bit, next day you are fresh again and you can work again. So this is very sustainable, very circular. So what would it look like if we start thinking in different ways of thinking and different ways of architecture in, in this sense? And it started with a little uh, example that I will show you here. I, we got a commission of these 13 pioneers that wanted to build their own house. And they said it has to be circular and we have to be, have our freedom to make our own house. So this is also an example of making modern communities. And here are the architects, that's me and my friend. And we are, of course, very enthusiastic uh, uh, architects. Um, ready to change the world. Actually, it's not very long ago, only a few years ago, but I lost my hair in the past few years, probably because of um, all the dynamics of our world. And this was uh, in a master plan of MVRDV, and you might know MVRDV. And what did MVRDV say? They said, we are going to invent a new way of urban 
planning because we see that the old way of urban planning actually is not working well. We see that uh, the old fashioned way of urban planning is only uh, directed and governed by the state. The state says there is a road here, there is a, a school here, there is a farm here, and there is a house there. And NVRDV said, we will not do this. This is old fashioned. Let the people decide for themselves, like Michelangelo. And we asked ourselves, let the, let the material decide what it wants. They said, let the person who actually uses this part of the city, this is a city in the Netherlands, let them decide themselves what kind of street do you want? Is it straight? Is it curved? Is it a circle? Or does it look like Barba Papa? I don't know if you know Barba Papa, but it's a comic with only round shapes. And they made only a very simple set of rules. You have to have so many land, you have to have so many green, people should be able to access this green, and you also have to make your own road. And of course, everybody else can use this road. And we happen to be, as architects, the first ones that could make a building in this new urban plan. So we could choose, and this is what we did. We made some kind of do-it-yourself architecture. We said to these people that were artists, and these artists had funny requests. They, they asked us, okay, Peter, uh, we want to have our house. We want to live there with our family. But also, I'm an artist. I want to have my studio space. And my studio space has to be big. And also, the house of my family has to be big. And also, I want a large piece of land because I want to have my own vegetables. And I want to, to, make, to have my own piece of nature. And actually, what you see here is the land um, of these people. We all want this. But also, we don't have money. So you have to solve this problem for us. You are an architect, you, you are smart, you have to solve this problem for us. We have no money, but we want a lot. Please help us. And then we said, okay, this is possible. This is possible, but then you have to listen to us carefully. That means that we will decide what your house looks like. You can do the inside, do it yourself architecture, but the outside is up to us as architects. And you can choose. We will give you seven windows and doors. You see them here, the seven windows and doors. And you can cut them out of a piece of paper and you can put them anywhere in the facade you want. But you cannot have different windows. You cannot have different doors. This is what you get and you cannot complain. And this is what happens. So we, we made this building and everybody could choose the exact location of their own door and window. And actually it looks pretty nice. The building is a unity. These people having no money, the building was really cheap. Actually, they had so little money that they lived for more than one year in a hut next to the building site, as you can see here on the left. But what started as a disadvantage, as something that they did not want, like you cannot design your own house, but also we said we are not going to design or build the inside of your house. The inside of your house, you have to do yourself completely. We will not, we will not do anything of this. We will make this empty shell and then walk away. And then you choose for yourself. So these eight families made their own floor plan. They made their own house. And what you, what you see here is these eight floor plans. And I must say, a few of these floor plans are really bad. They are bad floor plans. You would never design this as an architect. They make no sense, these floor plans. Um, they should show up here. Now the floor plans. No, oh, I will go back when this slide is not working. You see here the eight floor plans. You don't see the eight. You see here the eight floor plans. Some of them are really good. Some of them are really bad. And what is nice that the people felt the freedom of making their own floor plans. Um, and what started as a disadvantage actually became a big advantage. It became such a big advantage that now we are building number three of this housing complexes because there were so many people said, we also want this. So now I am coming to the end of my lecture. I have been talking now for more than uh, one hour almost. Um, and I will round off with the Arcadian Anthropocene. 
we have seen that we are now in the age of the Anthropocene, and this is our time. So we can make this time apocalyptic, but we can also make it Arcadian. And what, what will we do with it? What will the new logic of this time be? And you have to know that I am not only an architect, but I'm also a mathematician. So logic is, so, is my field. I wrote this piece that you see here, and I'm not going to read it to you because, to be honest, I don't understand it myself anymore. This is a few years ago. But the culture, there is a cultural dimension of science as there is a cultural dimension of architecture. And also science is a belief system. The belief system of our science is the Euclidean mathematics system and is based on five beliefs. Five beliefs that, that we think are true, but actually we don't know. They are called axiomas. And this story is important. You have to stay with me for a while. This story is important because we think that science is logic and science makes sense. But I am going to tell you here, science does not make sense. Well, actually, science makes a lot of sense, but only within the field of these five beliefs called axiomas. And there is, for example, this one axioma that we think is true, but we cannot prove it. And this axioma says that two parallel lines never touch. They will never cross. Two parallel lines will never touch each other. It seems like okay to say this. It seems like a very logical thing to do. But imagine that there is this one scientist, Riemann, and Riemann says, but what if they do? What if they do touch? Let's, Riemann says, he says, this is, this is not, not a truth. This is an axioma. This is just a, a hypothesis. So Riemann, he, he died very young. He was a, a fantastic, brilliant artist, a mathematician that's also an artist. And then this war between mathematicians breaks out. The war between mathematicians saying, you are insane, Mr. Riemann. Parallel lines do not touch. And then you have, on the other hand, the mathematicians that say, no, 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 Riemann makes a point. Maybe they do touch. And they write these books called Modern Rivals. And one of the books was written by this uh, mathematician, a very uh, smart, brilliant, uh, English Victorian mathematician called Charles Ludwig Dodgson, the author of this book, Modern Rivals. Euclid and his modern rivals. And he describes in this book the battle, the war between the people that think that parallel lines do cross and parallel lines do not cross. But he also wrote this book. The same mathematician under a nickname, Lewis Carroll, wrote Alice Advantage, Adventures in Wonderland. And th this book is a surreal, absurd book to most people, but not to Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll does not describe a surreal book. He says, I am not strange. I am not weird. I am not crazy. My reality is just different from yours. He describes the logic of our world after changing some rules. So he models a little bit with what we think is normal. But, but, but then in this new logic, things change. And of course, Einstein used non-Euclidean mathematics to provide the theory of relativity. So Riemann was right. Or maybe he's not right. You just have to change a few of your assumptions. And the axiomas of our world, they change all the time. Our society changes all the time. And we need to find new logics attached to this. And th these new logics of material, they are about... Uh, uh, or these new logics of architecture, they are about materials, about construction, but also, as we have seen about processes, about new logic, new system logic for economy, new system logics for typologies, and new system logics for expression of our architecture. And with these new logics, we will enter the Arcadian Anthropocene. And of course, you know the term Arcadia. Arcadia is this landscape where which is divine, which is not human. The weather is always nice. The people are always friendly. The animals love each other. The animals love people. But 
I am not a landscape architect. I believe that architecture will solve all the problems that, that our society is facing. And it can be solved by the most beautiful profession in the world. And that is architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, so much. And I think now we're going to move to Q&A session. Um, okay, the first question is, how do you, uh, do you use the same technology of recycling that Dave Hackens is promoting on Precious Plastics website? Do you know about this project? Of course, I know Dave Hackens very well. So, so there was this culture in uh, the, the 2010s uh, that started thinking about recycling plastics. And Dave Hawkins was one of the first protagonists of recycling plastics. And we have been in contact with him a lot, actually. And he's a fantastic designer. So it's the same technology? It is the same technology uh, where he, he provided machines at open, so open... Um, how do you shared systems? You can download the machine uh, manuals and you can make your own machine. And but he does not use the screw that we use in our uh, factory. But actually, this is only a detail, so it doesn't matter. You can have different machines for different purposes. We needed this injection mold machine because we wanted to make a facade material in large amounts. So we didn't we didn't want to make to stop after one or two um, tiles, but we wanted to make hundreds of them, and this is why we made our factory a little bit different than Dave Hacken's factory, which is more based on unique products, but in the same mode of thinking. So actually, we love his work. Okay, thank you. Uh, you say architects make drawings, but you actually research new ways to design and deal with material by building. Why is it important for you to build? So, so it is important for me to build. Uh, we started this as a, as a little experiment of, of how can we do it. We thought it was really strange that as an architect, you actually never face the consequences of what you do in the in the building itself so what normally happens is that we make a design we put it on paper and we put it in an envelope and we close the envelope and we send it to the client or the contractor and then we will not see anything anymore until the building is finished and we thought that this is really strange why why is this as architects, we should be the masters of the building site. And also, we understood that if we talk to the carpenter and if we talk to the layer, to the mason, we actually might learn something because these people know stuff that we don't know. So the building, um, the, the builders can teach us a lot. And the other way around is also to the carpenter, the carpenters that we had were so happy that the first time in their life, the architect talked to them and asked them, how do you do this? This is interesting. And then out of this conversation, something new arises. And we discovered that as architects, we might know a lot, but actually there's a lot to learn if you walk on a building site and talk to people who actually make it. Oh, sound. <laughs> Could you please repeat the name of the project where people made their own floor plans? And um, why would you let them do that if it makes the dwelling not universal for possible future users and probably worsen the experience of the cousin, current users? Um, I think this is a very good question. Um, uh, and it's also a very important question. So the project is called uh, Oosterbolt. I will write it down and then you can uh, share it. Oh, uh, uh, Oosterbolt housing. Okay. It's called Oosterbolt housing. I think that yes, as an architect, 
we do have skills and we do have experience and we do know how to design a floor plan. But I also think that everybody has a right to make their own mistakes. So everybody has a right to design their own house, their own living, their own way of life that is so unique that I might not like it. And I think it's useless and it's actually very stupid, but they might be very, very happy. And actually this turned out to be very happy people. Um, and I also think it might look like um, that, yes, this house is then there. And then when they sell it or when they leave, there is this ugly floor plan for the next inhabitant. But it is my, my, my conviction that, that, that we do not sell, we do, do not have to make standard houses all the, the time that are optimized for, a, for a, some kind of a general family that does not exist. We are all specific individuals and we all have our own wishes. So there will always be a family, a new family, a new person that, that will love this house that I will hate. Thank you. I hope this answer explains to the viewer. Um, how do you see this? Uh, when we talk about uh, the circular economy, are we mainly talking about Western countries? And uh, the viewers ask, how do you see the shift from a capitalist agenda where everything is aimed for endless production and consumption to circular economy mindset? What about developing countries? Yeah. This is also a good question. So developing countries, but also we we are in this sense developing countries, but um, develop because it's all new and we all have to find and invent this new economy. Developing countries might have, uh, they have of course difficulties and problems. And we live now in a time where we face difficulties that we have never faced before. So. It is not, it's not easy now. It's not easy for us, but it's even worse for developing countries. But they might be more than we are in the position of, uh, of inventing and developing a new economy, a new way of looking at money and material and things that is very difficult for us because we are also stuck in this capitalist system uh, that actually works for us, but in the end gives maybe so many, so many disadvantages that we will have to, to rechange, to, to change this system. And developing countries might have the advantage that they can allow themselves to have a more fresh start in this sense. So my, my, my idea is it's not a luxury product. The circular economy is not something that is only for rich um, people that care about waste and that care about the environment it is actually um it's going to happen naturally because we see that that producing waste and this this old-fashioned way of dealing with materials will not work in the future and developing countries might have an advantage there we will see what is your position towards sustainable architecture to which extent it contributes to global sustainability or on the contrary to climate change, especially now uh, uh, cross-laminated timber seems taken off and it's very popular material right now. What do you think about it, your opinion? Yes, so, so what I think about it is that, that it's, it's very important to understand that, um, that I want to I want to stick out of the discussion of what is right and what is wrong. So, so I want to refer again to the saying of says no to bone that actions have consequences um, and actions of how we use material now has consequences in the future. So it's not about moral issues. You can put moral issues in, but you don't have to. What, what I think that, that, that this sustainable thinking and circular thinking will bring and the, the CLT, the cross laminated timber example, actually is a really good example. It will, it will give us, it will provide us new ways of designing and new ways of inventing typologies or new ways of solving 
issues that are relevant in our society. For example, how can we make affordable housing in the city for everybody? How can we design more biodiverse buildings in the city where nature also uh, has, has its place? How can we solve all these problems using this new strategy? So I think the, the good news of the strategy is yes, it will solve maybe the climate problems. It will solve the difficulties of our global warming. Um, but what is interesting for us as designers and architects is that it offers us possibilities to make new designs and by making new designs solve problems that we could not solve before. Is this clear? Well, we don't know if it's clear or not because people can't respond as we all know <laughs> and we struggle with that, but I hope it is. Um, can circular economy be used not only in terms of material, but also in terms of buildings and even projects? Would it be better to reduce buildings even after the period of use has run out? Would it, would it be... Uh... Uh, would it, wouldn't it be better to reuse buildings even after the period of the use has run out? Ah, yes, of course. Yes, of course. Of course, it would be so much better. So the best service strategy, of course, use the buildings that we all have. So do not demolish them. Do not take them apart. The best, the best sustainable building is the building that lasts for 1,000 years. The, the, the best sustainable building is the, the building that people love. If you love something, you take care of it. What we have seen in the past years that actually we as architects and designers are capable of designing and, and making the buildings that people hate. So, so we, are, we are, you could say, in a wrong path. We make buildings that are so difficult to transform, that are so difficult to put new functions in, to put new uses in, that are so, so very specific to one function that there is only one escape for reuse and that is demolish the building and start all over again and of course this is insane and this is stupid we should not do that so the best strategy is make buildings that people love and make buildings that you can use over and over again without having to demolish it um i think we have a last question and we're going to wrap up after that. Um, is it hard to approve new materials with the government, municipality and people? Yes, yes, it is difficult to approve new materials. So the building industry is uh, in Europe and no doubt is the same in other countries in the world, a very traditional uh, industry. Um, and it's difficult to get new materials approved. Of course, it's good that, that there are demands and there, there are rules of new materials. They should last long, they should be safe, they should be um, ready to protect against fire and so on. So it takes time, but it's difficult to have the mind shift in the building industry that you use, that you look in a different way to materials and that you look in a different way in construction in constructing your buildings and th there is the major mind shift that we all have to to face that we have to be ready and that we have to be open towards new ways of thinking of materials and construction and typology and living Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, we don't have any more questions, but uh, the response from the viewers on our social media is amazing. And they, seem, they all seem very inspired by your presentation. Well, um, if you want, would like to say something, you can do that right now. There's yes, an opportunity. Please. Yes, please. So, so thank you so much for having me. And I, I, I really feel sorry that I cannot see you people, that I cannot see the audience. I would love to interact with you, but I don't know who is on the other side. I don't know who, who is there. But, but even if I don't know, even if I don't see you, thank you so much for being here. Um, 
it was really fun to do and I hope one day in my life I will be able to see you and face you and then we can share and discuss thoughts and ideas of a new face of the world with architecture. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And um, before we log off, um, I want to thank all, all of viewers for tuning in today. And uh, well, you can look up the video on a striker.com website and on YouTube channel. It's always going to be available. And um, we'll see you soon again. Bye.